morning to everyone and my fellow colleagues. So this morning I will be presenting uh, on uh, COVID about COVID pregnancy, COVID nineteen in pregnancies uh, As you know, because recently I think there's a hard, hard, high high profile case ever actually happened in Malaysia. So and we are in the middle of the pandemic and it's not going to end anytime soon. So I think it's if this topic will actually benefit all of us. All right. So this is the table of contents for the today's topic. So about in about a bit about introductions, uh, why uh, about these special populations and a bit of the physiological and anatomical changes in our in pregnancy lady and clinical presentations, the effect of COVID on pregnancy and the principle of management. And at the end of this uh this session, actually I will talk a bit about uh varicity nips la. Okay, so why uh first of all uh pregnancy is considered as a special populations, I think and I think as a emergency departments healthcare worker I think we are quite afraid and quite stressed when we are dealing with uh pregnancy ladies, I think I actually found out because I think we are not familiar with the anatomical and physiological changes in pregnancy, and we are dealing with two or more life. And we have to be familiar with different, I mean, the different resuscitation methods for both the mothers. And also if the, if the woman delivered, we have to deal with the, uh, the resuscitate the newborn as well. So, and most of the medication in preg pregnancies, actually we are not really familiar with due to their safety profile. And most of the medications actually, and in for COVID-19 per se, most of the medications actually not included in the research. Lab. So, and, as you know, uh, pregnancy lady have lower threshold to admit to our ICU and HDW. And last but not least, I'll talk about uh, the imaging ex radiation exposures in pregnancies. So let's talk about the physiological changes in pregnancies. I think the main, these are tables and I think we need to, I want us to focus on mainly on the CVS and also the recipe systems and also hematological systems changes in, during the pregnancies. So in terms of uh, cerebral vascular systems, so there will be increased cardiac output, about 20% increase in cardiac output because uh, maternal have to supply the bloods and in the, I mean, the circulations to the placenta and the fetus as well. So there'll be increased stroke volume and increased hurry to increase the cardiac outputs. And pregnancy is a vasodilatory state, so there will be reduced in blood pressure, okay? And at the same time, as the pregnancy progress to the third, second to third trimester, the gravity uterus actually can compress on the iota, so will further reduce the blood pressure. All right. For the respiratory system-wise, there will be increase in uh, tidal volume and reduce in vital capacity due to the uh, gravity uterus effect as well because it will split your diaphragms. So for the hematological system-wise, there will be, because uh, it's a mother nature's actually try to prepare the mothers to actually to enter the labor phase. So they will try to increase the red blood cells, increase the coagulation to prevent for excessive bleeding during the labor stage. That's why they will be increased in HB and they will be increased in coagulation factors. So these are the changes you need to bear in mind when dealing with pregnancy lady. All right. So the most common clinical presentation based on the large meta-analysis in US. So they found out, they actually screen, do a universal screening among in their populations and most of the patients with COVID-19 are actually asymptomatic. So, and those among those with who, are, who have symptoms, majority of them have cough, fever, and dyspnea. So I think we have to bear in mind, even though, when we, I mean, that's what we're dealing with nowadays as well, because sometimes the GP might refer a patients or the KK will refer a patients, a uh, pregnant lady with RTK positive. So that's, that's, I think that's not most more common now. So first of all, pregnancy itself does not increase the susceptibility to COVID. So it means that pregnant doesn't make the woman more easily to get contracted COVID-19 infections. So, um, but the pregnant actually will worsen the clinical cost of COVID-19 compared with those who are not pregnant. So it means that those patients, they compare those who are pregnant and non-pregnant among the COVID-19 patients. So those who are pregnant actually have more higher ICU emissions 
more of more of them actually receive invasive ventilations, ECMO, and the death rate actually increased in the pregnant populations. So this is based on the data from our CDCs like in US as well. We don't have a local data. So compared with non-pregnant women with COVID-19, as I said earlier, they have higher rate of ICU admissions. Um, they, in the article, they mentioned because uh, it tends, our ICU colleagues actually tend to have lower threshold to admitting this kind of patients. Rather than looking at the severity, they, because they worry the patients might need closer monitoring, that's why they bring them early into the ICU or high dependency units. And they have higher rates of receiving invasive ventilations. And because due to the respiratory uh, system changes during the pregnancies, we reduce functional residual capacity. But in the, uh, the data from our uh, UK, they doesn't seem to find that there doesn't seem COVID associated with increased risk in pregnant lady. So it's quite, con uh, there's two ways of saying, one is UK data and one is US data. So compared with pregnant lady without COVID, so they found that uh, pregnant ladies with COVID actually have increased risk of death. This comparing pregnant and non-pregnant. This comparing among the pregnant women, those who have COVID and those who doesn't have COVID. So, and COVID seems to increase the risk of preterm birth and the study in US actually found 9 to 4 percent of the preterm delivery is uh, itrogenic, means that uh, we are the one who induce the labor or we go in for early C sex, emergency C sex. And the main indication for itrogenic uh, preterm delivery is to improve the maternal oxygenations. So, patient may be in CAT 4 or CAT 5, so they couldn't can't really ventilate poor high, persistent hypoxia despite oxygen supplementations. So in, that's why they, uh, they actually uh, go in for uh, induce the labor and go in for emergency sex with the main indication is to improve the maternal oxygenations. So there are the risk factors uh, uh, with severe COVID and that risk factor that actually affects the mortality actually almost same as the general populations. So the first is the age, maternal age more than 35, BMI 25 and above, pre-existing maternal comorbids, for instance, chronic hypertension, pre-existing pre diabetic mellitus, pre eclampsia And in this, this study is based on overseas, so they found that non-white ethnic city actually have higher risk of uh, getting severe COVID-19 and also increased mortality. All right. So the complication also same as the general populations, the neurological like headache, these are all the long COVID, but what I want to focus more in this uh, sessions is uh, there's an increased risk of um, thromboembolic events like DVT, pulmonary embolisms, and cardiac myocarditis, and also endocrine hyperglycemia. So these are the main thing we would like to avoid because they are more life threatening. So in terms of management of um, COVID-19 patients, COVID-19 pregnant ladies in emergency departments, I think all of us have been attended the, I mean, the sessions previously by our colleague, Dr. Chong. So the principle of management are, are also the same. So oxygen, therapy, antiviral, corticosteroid, anticoagulant, anti-inflammatory, I will talk about it later in more detail. And, and one more thing special for pregnant lady is the fetal monitoring part and timing for delivery, especially for those with severe COVID-19 infections. All right. So the oxygen therapies, the protocol are the same. The step up protocol as per general COVID-19, we go with step one, which is a low flow oxygen, step two, high flow oxygen, and step three, NIV or uh, mechanical ventilations. All right. So um, in pregnant lady, so we have to bring up the SpO2 actually a bit higher compared with the general population. Usually in general population, we take more than 92. But in COVID-19, based on the R in pregnant lady, based on the RCOG UK, so they actually set our target of SPO2 94 and above. This is due to because, as you know, we have to supply oxygen not only to the mother, as, as also to the placenta and the baby as well. So they accept 94 and above. So, and always don't forget to consider other differentials because the most common symptoms are cough, fever. So don't forget about your bacterial pneumonia. So acute heart failure in pregnant lady and also APO because they can have uh, myocardiopathy in pregnancy as well. So do consider other differentials.
when dealing with COVID-19 as a, I mean, as part of the differential as well. So according to the sign from um, uh, of Scotland, uh, when should we refer patients, uh, COVID-19 pregnant ladies to our ICU or high dependency unit? So I can't find any others except for this from this guideline from Scotland. So whenever patient require rapidly increasing oxygen requirement, for instance, like 40, 20 mass 40 and above to maintain the SPO2 more than 94, kindly refer to our ICU. And those with severe respiratory distress, they take it respirate more than 26. And patients, you think there's a circulatory collapse, hypotension that can cause drowsiness, please refer because these patients require close monitoring so that, uh, and they need close monitoring you know, for the mother and the baby as well. And the timing of delivery have to be planned in by the ONG, anesthetists, and so intensive is. So how about proning in pregnant populations? So um, before this, before the COVID-19, so actually pregnancy, especially when second and third trimester, so it's considered as relative contraindications based on the UK Instances Care Society guideline. So it's a relative contraindication. So, and there's very little evidence, the benefits and the risk of it. So, um, but recently, for the past, since the COVID pandemic, actually there are several reported cases that suggest actually pregnant women can be safely prone. So, and in, because it helped to relieve both the diaphragmatic and iotocorp cable compression by the uterus, if performed correctly. So, I do like to stress again, proning is not a resuscitative method. It's not that the patient decides you prone her. I think it's as part of the like chest fissure. So despite uh, patient have to be a good SPO2, patient must be stable, hemodynamically, hemodynamically stable. Our main, uh, our main, I mean, the reason we are doing the proning is actually to improve the ventil ventilation perfusion meets mesh and also relieve the compressions by the, di uh, the diaphragmatic and aortal cable compressions from the gravid uterus. So I've actually, there's a articles by Toshius, actually they provide an uh, detailed advice, guidance and algorithm on how this can be done uh, in the second and third trimester pregnant lady. So these are the, from the guide, from the Toshio, uh, from the articles by Toshio. So actually same as the, this for a proning positions in awake patient. So they actually, the positions of the pillows is actually same as the general populations. So, but they do focus uh, more on the, at the chest and pelvis because you need to have adequate space to, to actually place your gravity uterus between the chest and the chest and the pelvis. So, um, as I say, this is not a rescue method. This is to improve the gen is the ventilation perfusion mismatch. You're going to prone in when you recruit more lungs. All right. So, meanwhile, for patients proning in intubated patients, these are are the same as what the ICUs are doing and same as the general populations. Okay, so what is the criteria you, to, for you to say, oh, this is patient is improving with our prone positions. So after you prone the patients, basically we need to monitor the SPO2 for at least 15 minutes and need to make sure the SPO2 is more than 95 and there's no signs of obvious distress and discomfort. The goal of proning in intubated, this kind of patients is actually to uh, at least two hours. I mean, in awake patient, at least two hours. In intubated, at least 60 hours. But this is, depends on need to deal with our primary team. So, and all continuous monitoring of SPO2 and also the blood pressure, ideally, uh, at here at line in intubated patients. So, what happens if the patients decide during proning? So, we need to increase the FiO2 if persistent refractory hyper hypoxemia, despite increasing the FiO2, we do consider, I think patient is not suitable for doing a prone, so we put the patient back to the normal position, so fine. All right. So um, next, I'll talk about antiviral. As we know, uh, antivirals are, in the, uh, are part of the management and when, when they're dealing with patients, COVID-19 patients in viremia phase, usually within the first five days, which is the viremic states. So what we are using in our hospital, our ED now is favipiravir, but it's contraindicated in pregnancy and because it is the teratogenics. 
and especially if if the if even though in general populations those who are uh, childbearing age we do advise them to avoid uh, si after taking your fabipiravir for at least two weeks all right so um, others antiviral right the CVL actually came up with mixed results uh, the trial uh, ADTT trial in US actually say it it's effective it shorten your time of recover and especially those patients who require oxygen trapped but the, the study by our WHO solidary trial actually show there's no effect or little effects on the overall mortality regarding an hospital duration. So it's mixed results. And all of these studies actually on the render CVL, as I mentioned earlier, all of these studies, they exclude pregnancy lady. So because it's non-ethical to include pregnant lady in the new drugs. So we have very limited pregnancy data. So based on our local guideline by our M uh, KKM, uh, they say remdesivir can be given if the benefits outweigh the potential risk. But this, this need to be discussed among the ID team, ID team, ONG team, and also the pediatric teams. And if given, those patients should be uh, are those who are requiring oxygen therapy, and especially early in the disease course when they have they are in the worrying phase. All right. So if you think the patients on the yeah, patient is on oxygens, the risk of deteriorating is high. Do consider the consult ID or and also our ONG team if you want to start. But I don't think we have Ramda CV in our ED. All right. So next about next corticosteroids, which is part of the management for general population as well. So it's recommended for to treat patients who are requiring supplemental oxygen, same as the general population, CAT4 and CAT5 for up to 10 days or up to discharge, whichever which is sooner. This is based on RCOG and our local guideline, KKM guideline. So as thing previously mentioned, by, uh, presented by uh, our colleagues on the COVID-19 management. So the, re they are, uh, the reason because we are giving in pregnancy, DEXA is recommended. Um, the re we are not, I mean, in general population, we are giving DEXA, but what we are so worried about DEXA in pregnant lady, so studies show that found that actually if you're giving repetitive cost in pregnant lady, it is has been it was shown to associated with small hip circumference, IUGS. So the fetal growth is restricted. There's increased risk of cat platelets and also increased risk of neonatal hypoglyc hypoglycemia due to the adrenal uh, insufficiency. So because DEXA it actually crossed the placenta. So that's why uh the, that's, that's why the, these are all the complications came after that. So that's why in pregnant lady, we start give, um, especially when it's the first trimester or beyond 34 weeks, that's why we change to tap pregnisolone or high IV hydrocort because pregnisolone and hydrocortisone doesn't cross the part, actually metabolize in the placenta tissue and doesn't cross, doesn't pass on to the fetus. That's why they are safe to use in pregnancy. So, but do bear in mind why we put a uh, pregnant lady in 24 and 34 week of gestation, why we give four doses of IV DEXA, because this patient, we are worried of they, them to get, get, go into labor and within a week's time, if they're deteriorating. So DEXA is given, the four doses of DEXA is given, is to, the main indication is to induce the fetal lung maturity. So because these are patients, 34 weeks, we worry they might go into labor, anytime soon within a week. That's why we give DEXA actually to induce the fetal lung maturity. So as you see, the 24 and 34 week, we give IV DEXA 6 mg BD for two days. But then after that, to induce the fetal lung maturity, then after that, we convert it back to like prednisolone and also IV hydrocots. So um, just take into consideration the gestation age and what is the best medication to give. Uh, always, if you have any doubt, always can always discuss with us, the colleagues. All right. So as I mentioned earlier, when, when there's thrombos, thromboembolism preventions, uh, pregnancy itself is a trom very uh, thrombogenic state. So, and the studies actually found that COVID-19 pregnant lady have higher risk of VT as compared to those uh, non-infected pregnant women. The risks are almost double to triple. So uh, this, um, the risk of um, getting thromboembolic event actually throughout the pregnancies and the worst is actually at the post, 
uh, pattern periods up to six weeks. All right. So, and on top of that, there's COVID-19. So it can lead to worsening of the hypercolorability states, especially though for those cat three and above. So, and especially uh, if the patients actually home quarantines, they might not move a lot. So this, all these actually will add up and create, increase the thromboembolic events. So uh, I'd like to introduce these charts actually from our local, our KKM guidelines. Uh, so it's a basically, it's a risk scorings of uh, PTE risk scorings like in pregnancy lady. So this chart, even before it actually exists, even before the pandemic, so excluding the COVID stage, these two criteria is actually, this chart is, was there before the COVID pandemic. Actually, they used to score the, score the pregnant lady. Any score above four, they will start on thromboprophylaxis. So as you can see here, so for those patients with CAT1 and on top of the previous, um, I mean the risk factors, this chart actually add on two criteria, COVID stage one and two, added one point. COVID stage three, four, five, automatically they will, become, they will score four. So automatically, COVID stage three and above, they have to start thromboprophylaxis. The main re justification because they are very thrombogenic. The risk of PTE is very high. So even though like usually we start for CAT4 and CAT5 in general population, in pregnant lady CAT3, they actually started as well. All right. So what are the medications given for to prevent this well, VTE? So uh, they actually, from our guideline, RCOG all recommend actually low molecular weight heparin. And because it's right, reliable, stable, and very easy to administer. So prof prophylactic dose, I think mentioned earlier, uh, anozaparin or eclexin for the MG subcard OD, or they can use tinzaparin, 4,000, 4,500 units also OD. So for therapeutics, same as the general population, 1 mg per kilo for Clexin, BD, Tinzaparin, 175 mg per kilo, OD. So how long will you need to give the VTE? Because they are very thrombogenic. All right, especially even though, even though after the patient delivered, they went into postpartum stage, they are also very thrombogenic. Can, the, the thrombogenic effects can last up to six weeks after the, post after the patient delivered. So according to the RCOG guideline, this is based on our, our RCOG guidelines, because this was not mentioned in our local guidelines. So uh, in, pre uh, in pregnancy, so basically you give up to throughout the emissions and continue for 10 days after the patient was discharged, after the patient was discharged. So you have to give at least 10 more days to after the patient was discharged. La. I think this is nothing to do. I think most of this, this was covered in the ward, but I just, in case the patient came back, so you have to bear in mind, the risk of VT are still there especially when the patient's uh, postpartum, the risk is five times higher compared with during the pregnancy times. All right. For uh, postpartum stage, actually, they give throughout the 10 days. Uh, they give throughout the emissions 10 days after they discharge. Sometimes they might even consider to give the heparins up to six weeks. That depends on the ONG. So if the patient's because what we worry, the, one of the risks of giving uh, heparin is the bleedings or the patient become thrombocytopenia. So if that happens, uh, can give mechanical aids like, like intermittent pneumatic compressions. All right. So, okay, let's talk about anti-inflammatory in COVID-19 pregnant lady. So as I mentioned again uh, earlier, all of these drugs for covid the antiviral, anti-inflammatory, the biologics, all are ex their, their trial actually exclude pregnant lady from their study due to ethical issues. So first we talk about tocilizumab, it's an interleukin-6 receptor antagonist. The dose is 8 mg per kilo, we're giving for general populations. So the studies, remap CAT actually found that if given within 24 hours in ICU, reduce the mortality, very good, reduce the progression to intubation, ECMO and even death. So at recovery study also found improved in survival uh, and also improved the outcome in patients with hypoxia and those patients in uh, cytokine release syndromes based on uh, CRP more than 75. So uh, for pregnant lady, so because the tocilizumab is a monoclonal antibodies and they theoretically it crossed the placenta. So there are no available data to say it's harmful, but at the same time, no the data say it's benefit as well. So um, I think this one also is based on the ID team, ONG. 
but you can always discuss with the ID colleagues and also our OG, ONG counterparts. So as if you can recognize patients in cytokine release state, cycloline, the CRS state, and also um, require high oxygen, I think no, no harm giving them a call. All right. So next, the only thing that difference uh, among between the late pregnant lady and also the general population of COVID-19 infection is they add on the fetal monitoring and also the timing of delivery. So for pregnant lady, um, regular fetal and uterine contraction monitoring is indicated. You can use CTG manually. So we have to chart it properly. No, uh, according to our uh, RCOG, uh, RCOG UK, it doesn't become like continuous monitoring. Just do it uh, for five, four to six hourly, depending on the gestational age. So about timing of delivery, it should be individualized. Uh, depends on the, mat the mother's, the, the maternal status, any concurrent disorder, the gestational age, and this should be a, this should be a timing of delivery should be a shared decision making between the clinicians, ONG, NS, patients, and also the PIDS team as well. So when we are dealing with patients with refractory hypo, what, our part is when we, are, we have to refer early to our ONG, NS team, and also pediatric team when we are dealing with patients with refractory hypoxemia, respiratory failure, or patients who are going into like shock state, multiple organs failure. So these are the patients we have to bring in all these teams, ONG, PIDS, gynae, and also NS team as soon as possible because they need to think because the indications, the, the only indications to like early delivery is other than the obstetric indications, the, for the maternal indications is to improve the maternal oxygenations. So we need to save the mother. Mother is the main priority. So when we're dealing with all these hypoxemia respiratory failure, circulatory collapse, involve them as soon as possible. So a little bit about the imaging because uh, what I, I actually encountered a few times because our radio actually, uh, I mean, not only radio, actually when we, when we referred a pregnant COVID lady to our ICU, all those on Ventimas, Cyclomas, they actually ask for X-ray. So don't worry, chest X-ray and CT are not contraindicated because they are they're actually below the uh, toxic dose. So the toxic dose, teratogenic dose is based on the units is less than 50 milligram. So uh, X-ray is more, less than 0 0.1, even though the CT is also about, maximum is about 10 milligram. So imaging are safe. So the reason we are doing imaging in COVID-19 pregnancy lady, one is to rule out other differentials. As I mentioned, maybe cardiomyopathy, you can see a heart failures, we can see APO, you can rule out tension pneumothorax. And the other one is the one for you to, for us to monitor the progress of the disease in COVID-19 so that we can compare what happened today, day one, maybe another three days will repeat. Is there any improvement or worsening? So it's not contraindicated. So always uh, don't worry about the radiations. All right. So this actually, this is one of the patients, COVID, uh, COVID pregnant lady. I think me and Dr. Man saw earlier in our research, which she came in in very severe states. La. So as a COVID care fight intubate on arrival with this X-ray, and unfortunately patients succumb due to, I think, because persist refractory hypoxemia and patient actually IUD. So to clear our minds up, because they are uh, our actually our um, our MOH actually provide a clinical pathway for COVID nineteen pregnancy, but it, at the end of the session, and uh, it still depends on our local host, local guide our local facilities la, guideline. So this is the one from our HTA, the flowchart of COVID in pregnant uh, ED patients. So basically. Admit all patients, regardless cat, uh, cat one to cat five, we have to admit the patients based on the, our, our, our hospital guidelines. All right. So cat one and cat two inform our ONG teams. There will be a COVID-19 ONG specialist. Just give them a call, inform them, and they'll admit the patients to either maternal hospital or 8A. So for cat three, uh, refer ID and admit to HKL. So for cat four and five, so uh, a bit controversial, I'll get back again, refer medical HKL. So, um, and patient most likely will read CAT4 and CAT5 whenever patient oxygen has, 
based on the indications I mentioned earlier, when to refer ICU. If you patient, you think the patient needs ICU bed, refer ICU, and admit, admit to either HDA, you admit to either HDA or HKR ICU. All right. This is the this are this is this is this flowchart is really for patients in HDA la, So nothing to do with us. So I think that's all for COVID nineteen in pregnant ladies. This are my reference. So um, as I mentioned earlier, the clinical, I mean, I mean the principle of management are actually same as compared with the general population. The only difference, maybe Adam, you have to consider timing of delivery, fetal monitoring, do a scan, measure the gestational age and if they're not sure or measure the, the growth of the child. Usually we refer guiding teams. All right. The medications, antiviral, biologics, anti-inflammatory, uh, I think need is a multi is a shared decisions like between ONG ID and also practice patients. All right, so next I will talk about a bit about baricitinib. So I think many of us heard is a oral medications is a Janus kinase inhibitor. So what it does, it blocks the activity of one or more of a specific family of enzyme. Basically, it stops. They actually interfere with the immune activations and they stop the inflammations. It hot the inflammations, yeah. So before before the COVID, baricitinib is actually is a treatment for moderate to severe active rheumatoid arthritis. So it's for those. Uh, and I think a few months back, it's actually authorized by FDA under UA emergency reflux of drugs. And in because this is based on the authorization is based on the studies, ADTT. So they found that baricitinib with render CV actually improved the outcome of the patients, especially those on high flow oxygen. So and baricitinib actually postulated to have some direct antiviral activity by interference with viral endocytosis, actually preventing the virus to enter into the host cell. So this is based on the NIH in UK. So of course they have some side effects because they stop they in they hot your inflammatory systems. So patients will have uh, prone to have other infections. The commons are respiratory and urinary tract infections. Some might have reactivation of herpes virus. It stops your inflammation. That's why you have myelosuppression, might have transaminitis, and also it's thrombogenic, thrombotic events, and also GI perforations. So when you start the patient on baricitinib, monitor the FVC, LFT, and RP. All right. So as I mentioned earlier, the FDA approved uh, baricitinib for COVID usage is based on this trial, ACTT2 trial. So it's a multinational, double-blind, placebo-controlled RCT. So about 1,000 patients. So they give, they basically divide into the intervention and placebo groups. Lah. So all of these patients, all of thousands, all of these 1,000 patients actually receive IV render severe. It's just that the interventional group, they, they give oral baricitinib about 4 mg OD, 2 mg if the GFR is less than 60, so for about 14 days. So outcome, how they assess is to, the primary outcome is to time to recover. And the clinical secondary outcome is the clinical status, how is the patient's conditions at day 15. So inclusion 18 years above COVID-19 confirmed case, evidence of lower respiratory infection, so, but do uh, just have a look because the exclusion criteria, pregnancy and breastfeeding. All right. So these are the, uh, the Kaplan-Meyer charts uh, of this trial. So um, the blue colors, the blue colors are the uh, baristinic group. The red colors are the placebo groups. So they are almost the same. Overall, baristinic actually found to be improved the outcomes as the days go. Is higher than the placebo groups. So about the same for CAT3, CAT4 and supplementary oxygens are quite still higher, still more superior compared with the placebo groups. So, but you can see there's a significant improvement in clinical outcomes in terms, especially for patient CAT4 on high flow or NIV. All right. So they found that the time to recover in the those who borrowed baricitinib actually shorter compared with those on placebo. All right. 
and there's improvement in clinical status at day 15 with the odd ratio of 1.3. No significant statistics, no, not statistically significant in terms of mortality. There's no reported serious adverse event or new infections in the interventional group. All right. So, and based on this trial, actually, the, our FDA actually approved uh, Baristin plus Remdesivir because uh, it's more superior. So, that's why they allowed, they use, actually, they approved these drugs to use in COVID 19 patients. So, and the most, um, most notably, I mean, the groups that actually receive the highest benefit is those who are receiving high flow oxygen or NIV. So, um, that's why these are their guidelines, NIH. So, for CAT4 patients who require oxygen through high flow device, like your nasal, high flow nasal cannula, high flow mask, or NIV, they, use, they give either DEXA, DEXA plus CV, and you add either baricitinib or TOSI. So, so on top of TOSI, before this, I think it was uh, this was mentioned by Dr. Chong. So there is a new drug, baricitinib. I think we are get, I think uh, HKL just uh, get trying to get as well. All right. So this is our local uh, KKM uh, actually guideline on they mentioned about baricitinib as well. So uh, if corticosteroids. For CAT 4A, those who are nasal prong, face mask, if cortical steroid is contraindicated, you can use remdesivir and baricitinib. For CAT 4B, those on high flow, or CAT 5A on NIV or high flow, can, high flow nasal cannula, they actually consider baricitinib for MGOD for 14 days. All right. And those adjustment, those adjustments, if the creatinine, serum creatinine is, I mean, the creatinine clearance less than 60. So this is based on our list that's both international and also our local guidelines. All right. Okay. I think, thank you. That's all from my presentation today. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Cyrus. Very excellent presentation, like a conference. <laughs> is there any question from the audience, uh, from the online audience? <laughs> Okay, uh, meanwhile, if I can share uh, about uh, just now the pathway, right, about CAT 4 and 5. Um, I have one experience, uh, uh, a 23-weeker pregnant lady in recess one. Uh, basically, CAT 4 to 5 lah, was started on high flow nasal cannula. So, uh, they kata that algorithm refer medical. Actually, we call up ID and at that time was Dr. Leong. So, he came down to recess and the patient was started on Tocilizumab. Uh, but uh, the it memang a shared decision. So Dr. Leong memang explained to the patient lah that uh, the apa ni, kalau ikut study memang pregnant are not uh, part of the apa ni, uh, in, in, uh, included in the study. But uh, they outweigh the benefit. And because hmm. ID boleh nampak yang pregnant lady ni memang very, very bad later. So that's why he decided to start tocilizumab. So the patient agrees. And then it was a shared decision. Uh, he called up um, ONG. So the specialist ONG also came down to also counsel about tocilizumab. Lah. So macam ada dua. So both team actually came down and the patient agreed. So started. Uh, that is one thing. And then second thing, I think that we need to, um, uh, untuk patient tu, uh, on high frenesi cannula. So memang taxi dia wipe out betul. But he was comfortable. So um, I think one thing we need to consider bila nak transfer ke HTA ICU is, um, is quite fine. So masa tu kita orang macam uh, KIV macam nak electively intubate sebab we know that uh, we don't have a rechargeable HFNC. So kena tukar kepada modified CPAP lah. But uh, luckily macam patient memang okay. And one senior MO accompany the patient lah. Uh, so yeah. Alright, ada soalan uh, dari Dr. Alza Cyrus. Oh. So um, for baricitinib, actually the trial in the ADTT2 trial, so the patients actually, uh, all the patients actually, they doesn't receive the regular dex, uh, steroid, particular steroid dose. Uh, so they actually exclude particular steroid, regular particular steroid usage in the, in the study. So based on the guidelines yeah, that they have, actually they, our local guideline, they actually they continue with the, the dosage. They still continue uh, 
with the dosage corticosteroid. So, but if based on the ADTT2 trial, they actually, they didn't include corticosteroid in their trial. The, the only indication for corticosteroid in the trial, example, uh, they give corticosteroid in the baricitinine group is when they have maybe acute exacerbation of asthma or patients that have adrenal suppression, that's why they started off steroids. Otherwise, the general population, they don't, the all the thousand patients doesn't receive corticosteroids. So, but based on our local guideline, they do recommend corticosteroids and baritinib given together. So we don't actually, I think we still should, they didn't mention about the dose, but I think we should, I think uh, depend on the stages, I think I will still give, I think it's still continue with the 20 hour, our, our regimes, 20 mg for OD for five days. Okay, is there any other question? Any other question? Yeah. So I guess, um... That's all, Cyrus. Mm, okay. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, we will upload the recording to our YouTube. Lah. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Right. Right. Thank you, Cyrus. Thank you, everyone. Right.